Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Woodyard, and I will be the moderator for today's panel on developing and engaging with scholarship through a diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusivity lens. I am also the Vice President of Education for the Costume Society of America, and I also serve on the DEAI Advisory Committee. The impetus for this panel is the new addition to the rubric used to jury submissions for CSA's National Symposium. When you submit a paper, these columns are used to jury your submission. We have added a new section that contributes to the overall score, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. So for example, to get three points out of three, the topic or perspective has to demonstrate diversity, equity, inclusion, and or accessibility in subject matter research. In order to get two points out of three, it needs to touch on those issues and you still get one point uh, if you do not demonstrate this. This summer, the board of CSA voted to add this section to the rubric on the advisement of Vice President of Education, which is me, and the DEAI's committee's suggestions. Now this category aligns with CSA values and the diversity statement that was adopted in 2020. Part of CSA's strategic goal includes, quote, to increase diversity in subject matter and research, including hidden, overlooked, and, um, marginalized topics. Uh, additionally, in 2020, the CSA board approved the DEAI statement, which you can read on our website, um, that says, I just kind of picked out a couple quotes here, um, quote, we as an organization commit to eliminate discrimination and provide equitable treatment of all members and those affiliated with CSA. We aim to reject white supremacy, ableism, ageism, homophobia, fatphobia, xenophobia, and other biases in the organization's future practices. Quote, we highly encourage scholars and professionals to conduct all of their work with a heightened attention to diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion issues. And quote, we are committed to developing action items to promote diversity, equity, accessibility, and inclusion that are based on goals outlined in our current strategic plan and future goals as outlined by the DAI committee. Now, just briefly, I'm going to touch on kind of what it means to get three points out of three. I'm not gonna give you examples of scholarship. The uh, panelists tonight are gonna to talk a little bit more about that. Um, but to get three points out of three, you have to uh, meet at least one of the criteria below. Um, explicitly uplifts at least one marginalized community's voice or story through a marginalized community's own narrative perspective and or primary sources. So for example, if you're writing about black women, um, explicitly stating that you're using sources that come from black women and not from white women. Uh, and this is the primary focus of the research. Second, secondly, uh, the content brings explicit attention to power, privilege, and oppression. And this was the primary focus of the research. For two points out of three, um, you would need to follow one of the criteria below that you uplifted at least one marginalized community's voice story through uh, the community's own narrative or the narrative of the dominant community. For example, if we're writing about black women using sources that come directly from black women or white women, but it's not necessarily the primary focus of the research or perspective. Um, secondly, the content brings atten attention to power and privilege or oppression. However, that is not the primary focus of the, the research. Now to get one out of three, again, you can still get one point out of three, which is important to note. Um, if you do not uplift at least one marginalized community's voice or story through their own narrative or the narrative of a dominant group and do not bring attention to power, privilege, or oppression. Now this, so you can just kind of take a look at the rubric and, and read it if you, if you would like. Um, this panel is here today to advocate for the research that centers diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, and to provide examples of how to do this type of work. Like all research, it is vast and we will not be able to touch on all aspects of the work, nor are the panelists experts in all areas. If you are doing this type of research through your design, exhibitions, and writing, I would strongly encourage you to submit an abstract for the upcoming symposium in Minneapolis. And these abstracts are due on October 15th. And you can see all of the details on the call for papers, which is linked on the website. If you find national symposium, you can find the call for papers underneath that link. If you do not apply this lens to your research or your design and exhibition written work, I hope that this discussion will give you the tools to reconsider your perspective. Um, I think it's really important to say this specifically plainly though, that this is a panel of white identifying women with much privilege. 
Um, and our identities are a reflection of the problematic nature of our field and why we need to advocate for DEAI work centering historically marginalized communities and scholars that are currently doing this work. We hope to inspire scholars to think through this lens for future work, but also recognize that there have been many scholars who have done this work for years, such as Ben Berry, Regan de Logans, Tamika Ellington, Crystal Harmon, Kimberly Jenkins, Gary Lampley, Darna Lisby, Michael Mamp, Dais Matthews, Amanda Mohammed, Jalisa Reed, Yolanda Sanders, Jonathan Michael Square, Paige Tomford, Artie Sandu, and Elizabeth White, just to name several. We would highly encourage you to check out the work that they have produced. So can you introduce yourself and tell us what kind of work do you do and how do you engage in centering justice in your research? Hi, sure. Yeah, thank you. So hi, everyone. I'm Sarah Scaturro. Um, I'm currently the Chief Conservator at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Um, and previous to that, uh, I joined the Cleveland Museum in uh, the beginning of the pandemic, actually. But previous to that, I was the Head Conservator at the Costume Institute. So um, I'm really here on this panel as kind of um, the person who's very object-centered um, and museum-focused, um, trying to represent possibly both conservation and curatorial perspectives, but I am a conservator for sure. Um, and so in discussing this issue, um, I think it's helpful to think of three questions when you um, approach DEIA work, particularly from a conservation perspective, but also curatorial. Um, the first would be, you know, what is being conserved and what is being researched and, and what stories are being told, right? So um, traditionally, especially at the Costume Institute, for example, you have upper class white women's clothing, um, you have their stories being privileged. Um, and so it's trying to maybe refocus this and say, okay, well, whose experiences do we really want to amplify through this object-based research that we want to do? And um, one really good example that uh, recently came out was Kristen Stewart, who's the curator of the Valentine Museum in Richmond. She did this really great crowdsourced conservation project to uh, preserve the dress of uh, Fanny Chris Payne, who was one of the best black dressmakers um, in Richmond. And so that's just like one example of, of thinking, okay, what are we choosing to conserve? All right, so then, um, I'm just going to go on to the next one because I know we really want to open this up for a discussion. The, the second thing I think about is who is doing the conservation. And this to me is really, um, as now a hiring manager, um, this is really at the forefront of my mind. Um, conservation is one of the whitest professions um, in the museum. And um, not only is it white, the barriers to entry for the field are very difficult. Um, and so it really seems to allow more upper class um, females that um, have the ability to work for a very long time for low wages or even for free. Um, and so in trying to address this, you know, I, I really um, am focusing on issues of, you know, diversity in the field. And I'm not alone. The whole conservation field, I think, is really coming towards this, you know, diversity. But what does that also mean? That, that does mean able-bodiedness as well as race and ethnicity and class. Um, and then the other part of who is doing the conservation is trying to share authority. So conservators and curators are often seen as the authority on the information, but you know, we're not, especially. Um, we should be looking outwards towards you know, the communities, towards the stakeholders, and inviting them to take real partnership in the decisions we're making about what is being conserved and how they're being conserved. Um, so I'll just go to the third kind of issue that is at the forefront of my mind with this issue is how things are displayed. And I'm sure if any of you have read the forum recently, you saw there was this really great uh, vibrant thread on, you know, mannequin dressing and mannequin choice. And I admit I took a little part in that, um, but just coming from the understanding that our choices are not neutral, right? And so, you know, I helped install the China Through the Looking Glass exhibition at the Met in 2015. And all of the Western fashion was shown on these mannequins and all of the Chinese garments were shown flat, abstracted on T-bars and actually behind the mannequins. So, I mean, what does that tell people when they're coming to visit the exhibition? So it's these very kind of simple things, but you know, sometimes it just takes a moment for us to step back and understand that 
Our choices in the curation and conservation of fashion are not neutral. They all mean something. Hi everyone, I'm Katie Knoll. I am currently working as a contractor for the Smithsonian um, with the uh, American Women's History Initiative as well as their Open Access Initiative. And my title is Representation Matters Metadata Coordinator. So my work is focusing on collections, metadata, and descriptive practices, focusing specifically on gender and how gender is documented in the collections across the Smithsonian. So everything from libraries and archives to museum collections. And I'm even trying to think about living collections like at the zoo and the gardens, which sometimes can be um, gendered an interpretation of trying to explain the natural world to visitors in ways that are creating um, replications of human-centered gender concepts onto non-human subjects, which is something I've never thought about before, but here I am. Um, and my research background, my academic background is in history. And so I'm trained as a historian and my specific research for the last several years has been about enslaved people's clothing and textiles, um, specifically that enslaved people wear themselves, not necessarily that they're making for other people. Um, and I really, I, when I am doing my work, try to constantly understand um, how I am approaching it from my my moment in time, who I am in my life experience, and how that's impacting the way that I'm understanding the sources that I'm studying. And I try to prioritize sources that are by the people who had these experiences. Um, as a historian who does material culture, I'm kind of an oddball in the history world. Um, historians are rather notorious for studying change and hating it. Um, so I sort of came into um, history programs wanting to do museum work and curation and tailoring my uh, graduate papers and my dissertation toward material culture. And I'm glad that I had a program that accepted that as a topic um, at a time period when it really was, was even more challenged than it is now. And that opened up the possibility of how to study history and how to study people's lives who didn't leave a lot of writing. And the writing that is left about them is mostly about them and not by them. And it is about them in incredibly, incredibly violent and harmful ways that it's, it's really difficult to get around when you're trying to understand what their lives were like. Um, and so that's kind of, just a brief explanation of how I approach my work and really centering the experiences from primary sources of the people who lived these lives and also looking at the scholarship by people who are living more directly with the legacies of slavery in the 21st century today. Um, and so primarily then meaning and um, African-American scholars and black people across the African diaspora. I do a lot around gender. And so trying to look at how black women are talking about the experience of enslaved women, but also thinking about gender across different gender identities. And so looking to how men are talking about slavery, um, male scholars are talking about slavery. And trying to understand their perspective and how they see and approach the past in ways that I don't always see because I am a white woman living today. And um, that has been really transformational in my work. I, since I finished my dissertation, I've continued to study this topic for several more years. And it is really after graduate school and my experience working as a contractor at the Smithsonian's African American History Museum, where the leaders of that museum are Black people. And we were looking to them to help guide the work that I began to see my work in even more ways as um, 
something that I needed to continue to develop and, and challenge how I was seeing and reading the sources. And I think that is the most important thing that I have learned about doing social justice centered work is that no matter what you have produced, there's always a space to look at it again and say, okay, what did I miss this time? And that doesn't mean that you don't put it out there because you've got, you've got to put it out there at some point. It means looking at it and saying, okay, what do I feel strongly about that I did well here? And where did I miss something? Either because somebody else pointed out to me or I noticed it later. And how do I not do that again next time? So I will kind of leave it at that as the sort of understanding that this is constantly an ongoing, unfinished process um, for anybody who is doing this work. I think no matter what your background is, we all have gaps in our knowledge and our own lived experiences that will uh, impact how how we are doing this work. Thank you, Katie. Kelly? Hi everyone, I'm Kelly Reddybest and I'm an associate professor at Iowa State and I also direct the ISU Textiles and Clothing Museum. I also have my co-presenter here with me, Mabel. <laughs> so, um, And so in my work, I largely look at the representation and experiences of historically marginalized communities in both in different parts of the fashion system and largely also in fashion curriculum because I am a professor. Um, and so almost all of my work is um, is largely rooted in social justice um, with aims to promote social change and largely like how our identities and like how our experiences are um, regulated by cultural norms. And so I have like four guiding questions that I um, that I usually ask. Um, and so I usually ask, you know, how is the fashion system creating space for historically marginalized communities? How do historically marginalized communities negotiate their identities? Um, and then how are they represented in both current and historic contexts? Um, and so I'm largely trained in social science research. <laughs> Mabel's very excited about all this. Um, and also um, history as well. Um, and so I largely center marginalized identities by the content of the topics that I'm asking. Or if I'm not centering a specific community, I'll bring attention to power, privilege, and oppression by drawing upon various theoretical texts, which I'll talk about in the in the next question. So I'll go ahead and stop there though. Well do you want to go ahead and move on to section to the second one since you were just chatting about it? Um, so sure, yeah, if you yeah. want to expand on what readings, objects, or exhibitions have changed the way that you do research, and we can just kind of go backwards or back around, that's okay. Yeah, of course. Um, so there have been um many um reading it's largely readings for me. Um, and so because I uh, teach, um I'm often you know, pretty engaged in the literature. I teach like a graduate level um, course called Social Science Theories of Appearance, and we're often like reading deep theoretical texts. And so a lot of mine um, in the resource that I believe will be shared um, with the group um, are theoretical texts. Um, and so I would say one that largely just changed the way I think is this text by um, Kafer, and it's called Feminist Queer Crip, and it was published in 2013. And that book really changed my whole perspective on time and ability and really thinking about like how I view scholarship and disabilities and the intersection between feminism, queerness, and ability. Um, I would also say that um, another text that has really just changed my, or just different scholars too, like Ben Barry's work just is so, I'm always like so inspired by his criticism and like how he frames research. Um, and so I would say Ben Barry's work um, specifically, he just published a really insightful paper in fashion theory called Intersectional Interventions into Queer and Trans Liberation Against Right-Wing Populism Through Fashion Hacking. And really just the whole approach to that paper um, and how he answered research questions and how he built the study it was really inspiring to me. Um, also, um, uh, like thinking also about um, tribal crit theory, um, so Bray Boy's um, paper that was published in 2006 has also um, been really informative for me, thinking about indigenous ways of knowing, um, and that largely came from um, 
uh, sadly, my graduate student who passed away, Dana Godin, um, she taught me a lot about indigenous ways of knowing and thinking. Um, and so I honestly, it's my students who also really inspire me, <laughs> like who I like, who are really challenging me all the time. And I just love it. Thank you. Katie, can you answer that question? What readings, objects, or exhibitions have changed the way that you do research? Yeah, um, I also, I put three sources in the bibliography that I think is being shared um, that are, are things that I come back to frequently. Um, and two of them are theoretical. One is a, actually an edited collection of like essays and poetry and art called This Bridge Called My Back. Um, writings by radical women of color that was published in, I think, 1980, I don't know, early 80s. Um, and it's since been reissued several times. And it is women from all different kinds of backgrounds and intersecting identities that are writing in a lot of ways in response to the women's liberation movement of the 1970s that they felt very excluded from, as well as civil rights movements that they felt excluded from including um, the African-American civil rights movement, the Chicano movement, um, and the gay liberation movement that just were not paying attention to women and were silencing them a lot of times in the name of prioritizing male leadership. And um, there's, there's a lot of really great pieces in there that come at it from different angles and always make me rethink things. Um, but if I was actually going to point back to one text that really put me on the path of my research trajectory, I think it was in college, I took a class about the history of women and slavery, and we read Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl by Harriet Jacobs. And I, I think, looking back, it was the first time I had ever read something by a Black woman who had experienced enslavement. Um, and so it took me to to college to get there, but I somebody finally put that something like that in my hands. And reading about her experience with her enslaver who rather oddly asked her permission that he wanted her to be his mistress. Um, and she did not want to do that. And she ended up protecting herself by entering into a sexual relationship with another white man. Um, because his white manness protected her from this other white man who was her enslaver. And that's, you know, a really complicated part of the story, but what really stood out to me was her relationship with um, her enslaver, who was the wife of the man who legally owned her, and who berated and threatened and was very abusive to Harriet Jacobs because she felt threatened by her husband's desire for Harriet Jacobs, his desire for power. And instead of being cognizant of the relation, the power dynamics of that situation, of how that how damaging that was to Harriet Jacobs, her um, the mistress um, was just for for the causing causing for their harm. And I I I remember thinking, I don't want to be the type of white woman who does that. And I think that is why I entered onto the, the interest that I had in really understanding the experiences of enslaved people and what that was like. I did not grow up in the South at all. Um, and so I didn't have direct local knowledge or experience of, of that environment growing up and the legacies of it in that very direct way that, in the, that happens in the South that is different from the legacies of slavery in other parts of the United States. Um, and I, I really think that, that reading that book was and hearing what Harriet Jacobs had to say about her life and how hurtful it was that this other woman, this white woman, couldn't see and couldn't be there for her. It, it, it changed my understanding of how I could be and do this work. Thank you, Katie. Sarah? Yeah, um, I don't think there is just one text that <laughs> set me on my way. I mean, I'm still learning. Um, I'm 
this is, I'm still a work in progress. Um, I would say that, um, you know, I'm, I'm a doctoral student at Bard Graduate Center and through my exams, my reading exams and, you know, my courses, that's when I started really getting exposed to a lot of conservation theory and understanding that there were, um, there were different approaches from what I was taught. Um, you know, I was taught really um, what's called like a traditional materials based approach where we're looking to conserve the, the actual material in front of us. Um, but if you actually think of it, there are, are values based approaches where you're looking to preserve the values attached more so than the materials. And then there's people's based approach where you're looking to um, preserve that relationship between the object and the stakeholders and the people in the community. And um, so in the, the resource list, I, I did put a um, Miriam Clavier's book, Preserving What is Valued um, there, which is a real fundamental text for conservation. Um, a lot of this work was of course done um, with the uh, First Nations, um, with conservators where there's a lot of this collaboration. Um, and then I would say a second kind of part of my growth is, you know, I. I was eight years in the, the juggernaut of the Costume Institute. I, I saw it. I, I know how those shows get up. I know how they get curated. And um, there, you know, there's some problems with the shows. And um, I, I've been able to really start being much more critical in lending my, my eye to assessing exhibitions. And so one really excellent exhibition that I want to call out that's up now, which was, um, you know, curated, uh, co-curated also by Tamika Ellington, who you had mentioned, um, is the, the exhibition at Kent State, which is called Textures, the Art and History of Black Hair. Um, so that's a show in my mind that really is um, justice-centered and um, an amazing exhibition. And really, um, you know, during a lot of the George, you know, Floyd protests, the Costume Institute, you know, the curator was mentioned that he was going to recurate it to add um, more black designers. And like, there was like one or two, I mean, it was very token. And so, you know, you've got an example of like kind of a, a tokenist take on, on trying to be more justice centered and then a truly justice centered exhibition. Yeah, I mean, and that, that really, well, and one, I just wanted to mention the textures exhibition. I think it has a catalog that goes with it, if I'm not mistaken, so people can, can get the catalog. Um, and also, I think that you really answered the next question, but I don't know, maybe you have more to talk about with this or, or not, which is fine. Um, but I was going to ask everyone, you know, can you give an example of work that centers justice versus having it more on the periphery, which kind of connects back to the rubric idea of, you know, Three out of three is where you really center that justice, you center those voices, and um, the periphery is when it's like not the focus necessarily. Yeah, so um, I will um, highlight one of my students' work uh, that we just put up. Um, my students and I and my co-curator, Jennifer Gordon, um, they just did, we just uh, did a collaborative project, um, and I'll put the link to it in the in the chat and it's called um, fashion forward centering justice in fashion history so we reinterpreted objects um, from a justice oriented lens and so it's a student faculty um, collaboration and we the students had all read you know various texts in like my classes or other classes that they took on campus and then um, had um, reinterpreted some of the objects um, that were deemed treasures um, in our teaching collection. And so at, in, at Iowa State, we are, we are teaching focused, so we cater to the curriculum so that way the design and the merchandising students can like learn about, you know, fashion history. Um, and so I would say that, you know, this is like an example where um, we really took these objects from our collection and thought through, you know, racial justice and women and feminism and cultural appropriation and socioeconomic and class barriers and environmental racism. So not, not only looking at things like um, sustainability, but like the intersection between um, racism and uh, uh, sustainability and how that is, um, you know, it, it oftentimes disproportionately impacts 
communities of color, right? So we were really trying to think through those those things to tell, um, to retell stories. Um, and so the students, I'm a proud professor over here, <laughs> built this awesome uh, digital uh, catalog and then also are mounting it right now. And so I'm like really proud of them. <laughs> so um, yeah, so I would say like, that's like an example where we didn't necessarily center communities, marginalized communities, we like used objects. Um, and yeah, that's the example I would share. Yeah, and I got a chance to listen to a section of that, and I thought it was fantastic. This, the, re, the fact that you can constantly reinterpret, reimagine, question, and kind of keep going. I think that that's what's so a great example from one of the many good examples from what your, your students are doing. Um, Katie, how would you like to kind of answer that? Like, is there something that you can think of that really centers justice versus having it on the periphery? Um. I have a, another example, but since we're talking about students, and I also, I had missed this whole conversation about mannequins in the forum, and I'm just going to put out there that I, I was at um, CSU until this summer. I left CSU. I was um, curator of the Avenir Museum, and I taught a grad class last spring, and the students did an exhibition that is called Where is Everybody? Mannequins and Mounts, that is currently still up. So if you're in or around Fort Collins, you can come see it. And it directly deals with the fact that mannequins are never neutral. Um, Kelly's work was instrumental to understanding some things for them there, as well as Sarah's. We read a lot of Sarah's work too in our class. And um, if you aren't in Fort Collins, then follow the Avenir Museum on social because they have been sharing a lot of um, content that is from that exhibition. And the students did just, they thought of things that I hadn't thought of. As, they, you know, as they always do and ask questions in ways I hadn't been thinking um, and presented an exhibition that is primarily of white, as in like true white colored mannequins that talks about diversity um, in a, all of its different forms, able-bodiedness, age, race, um, gender. It, they did such a fantastic job. Anyway, I stop rambling on about them. Um, this actually is calling out um, a different class that I taught a couple of years ago and comparing it to how they interpreted um, this um, topic versus an exhibition that the Smithsonian did that features um, the same story. And at the Smithsonian, um, this is from an exhibition called Girlhood. And I will, I think I can put the um, link here in the chat for everyone and you can go to the page. Um, so it's still up digitally. They have a section on fashion and there is um, in, within that section a page called Girls Have Fun, 1890s to 1910s. And it mostly talks about, um, you know, fashion of that time period, women moving around more in society, um, bicycling outfits, the shirt waist, um, the Gibson girl. And then there is, um, as you scroll down, a part about hat pins. And it says young women used hat pins to keep their large fashion statements attached to their heads. And then it's in the next part, it says, while one end was decorative, the other could be a deadly weapon. Americans worried about young single women alone in cities and journalists seized on the hat pin as a form of self-defense against sexual assault. This I would consider more of a peripheral kind of it's it's dealing with the topic but it's not centering or prioritizing the experiences of the young women they are not the actors in the story so it says americans worried about young single women and then it says journalists seized on hat pins and it has a um, graphic from an, a newspaper of the time that gives you this like step-by-step -step way to defend yourself from sexual assault which is really quite interesting um but they um other example that I have is from an exhibition that um, we did at the Avenir that was called Respect the Dress. It was about women's rights activism in US history told through dress. How did they engage with, with clothing and activism? And um, I, one of the graduate students who was doing the research for the exhibition um, found the same secondary source that talks about this, this issue in this time period and we used a different example from another newspaper that was about a specific woman and the content in this exhibition said as the 20th century neared women began to move around public spaces more frequently 
Americans flock to growing cities. Um, crowded trains and elevated rail cars could bring women into close proximity with men, which sometimes encouraged unwanted physical advances. Uh, newspaper articles around the country recounted sensational stories of women using the fashion for large picture hats to protect themselves. Because of their size and the puffed hairstyle popular, women used very long hat pins to secure these hats to their heads. In the case of Leotti Blaker, the young woman was not going to allow an older man to put his hand on her lower back while riding in a crowded stagecoach. She removed her hat pin and stuck it right into his arm, causing him to scream loudly and leave the coach. She told the paper she used her hat pin another time to ward off a would-be robber from stealing her handbag. And so here, she, her, she is the actor in the story, and that to me centers this more. Um, oh, sorry, I can tell you what page it's on. It's on page um, 14. And um, now I didn't have the same label constriction con um, length con uh, here, and this was really representing this era in the exhibition. Um, but one thing that I think, again, like looking back critically, like what would I do different? Talking more about the fact that she is a young white woman and she's like this innocent from Kansas who's come to the big bad city of New York. She has a lot of privilege. And the reason that this is an item of interest in the newspaper is because of her young, attractive white womanhood. And that is not brought up in the exhibition, in the, in the label. And so while I do think it centers the experiences of these young women more than the, the other example, there's always still, again, room to do something more. Um, and so that's the example that, that I had there. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Katie. It just reminds me of everything that's going on right now in the news. You know, it's still an issue. So we do have one more question that we kind of prepared. However, it's 7.44. And so I kind of wanted to ask the panelists, would you like to continue the, our discussion or do you want to kind of turn towards questions for, from the audience? I think we should take questions. Okay, sounds good. Um, let me go back up to, okay. So we had one at the beginning and they say, dear presenters, if you have time, my question is developing, engaging and publishing. Where can the scholarship be published? What steps can be taken to provide a venue for the scholarship in CSA journal dress? I would say that uh, Tina, the editor of dress is really receptive uh, to work that centers DEAI. Um, I personally have put manuscripts in review with her and um, she's open to knowledge and ideas that, you know, even sometimes I'm not familiar with these ideas until I research them. And then, because I might be uh, doing a project about um, like the queer and trans community and, you know, I might not have known, I'm a cisgender person, so I might not be super familiar um, with everything, of course, you can't be an expert in every area. <laughs> and um, I have found that uh, Tina has been really great. Um, I, I would definitely uh, say that. I think it's uh, certainly welcome. And also um, the DEI, DEAI committee has been uh, working with all the different um, areas and I'm pretty confident that they are interested in, in having submissions that centered. Yeah, thank you. And of course you and um, Denise Nicole Green did a special um, feature um, about queer fashion a couple years ago. So if people are interested in, in that, that's available. Katie, did you have something that you wanted to add? Yeah, um, I think the other place to look is in, you know, what journals that are from that area of like the group of people you're studying. And so for Kelly, maybe she looks at queer studies um, and those organizations and the journals that they publish. Um, certainly, I'm looking at also just history or public history, as well as African American history, gender studies, um, um, indigenous um, studies, all of those different groups of, of scholars have their own journals. And I think that they would be receptive to understanding more about how fashion and dress can help them with 
you know, areas that they focus on. And you may find that that there are folks out there who don't come from, they're maybe not connected to CSA or dress studies, but they are thinking about and problematizing and studying fashion and dress or how people are presenting themselves in the world. And they might be super excited to find out that the Costume Society of America is even a thing. So I've, I've definitely found that as somebody who works, you know, across and between different disciplines. Sarah, did you have anything you wanted to add relating to conservation? Or Kelly, did you, you unmuted for a second? Uh, I had just one follow-up thought too, and the idea that there are these, there are these um, focused journals, I mean, you know, Journal of Lesbian Studies, um, Journal of Homosexuality, uh, all, you know, uh, womenist, uh, uh, there's many, many. <laughs> but then also like thinking about you know, another journal, you know, clothing and textiles research journal or dress, you know, I think that, you know, submitting to those journals, I think is, is important too. And I don't think Katie disagrees with this, um, you know, at all, but, you know, just, just highlighting that, like to, to submit work there. Um, and, you know, if it's rigorous scholarship, it'll, make it through the review and there might be extra labor. I certainly have experienced that. You know, you have to do a little bit more explaining sometimes, um, but it's not that it's without, it, if the scholarship is rigorous and it goes through the blind peer review, blind peer review is the is a beautiful thing because it's it really helps your work improve. Um, and I think that, you know, at least, at least with dress, I think that Tina is such a great editor and finds great reviewers. Um, and so, you know, just thinking about like centering the, you could go to a peripheral journal, but you could also center in these other journals that focus on like dress and fashion too. So just the last, last little um, thought I had. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, I didn't mean to say don't publish in dress. Absolutely do. I have, that was one of my first publications. It's very important. Um, and I, I'll just say like one thing that I have noticed is that I'm, I'm, I have to explain fashion to the people who study slavery, and I have to explain slavery to the people who study fashion. And it's not that either group doesn't think it's important. I'll say, if anything, fashion is the one that I get more resistance about being important. Um, so, it, you know, it's, it's there's always some level of explaining that I'm doing to people about not just why the work is important, but how to understand it. Um, and just when you are submitting to different kinds of journals, whether it's uh, like CTRJ is also gonna be a different experience than dress, um, that you just think about the audience of that journal and what part of your work might you need to explain and flesh out a little bit further that you would just assume another audience would know that, that scholarly background. Yeah, and I would also just say that um, you know, there are alternate models of distribution. There are a lot of really great online journals, you know, Ben Berry and Allison Matthews David, you know, um, their fashion studies journal, but um, you can think of like digital humanities projects like Jonathan Michael Squares, Fashioning the Self. Um, so there are, is alternate, you know, there are alternate ways of getting out your research. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm glad that you brought up those different areas because there's so much like good work being happening actually in those those other spaces too. Everyone should submit to dress, absolutely, but also you can also have there's other options too. Uh, there's a question from another Sarah. You're in good company. <laughs> How can we center marginalized communities in research that seems quote unquote unrelated without seeming like it's forced or the connections are weak? for example, or i.e., how do we do this in an honest, meaningful way when developing research purposes? Um, I'll just say one thing briefly. I think that, thanks for the question, Sarah. So I think that in that instance, it's like thinking about power, privilege, and oppression. And if you're not centering the, the group, like a marginalized group, right? You might not be studying queer and trans people, but if you're not, are you only describing the folks who you're looking at as people versus cisgender people, right? And so it's like the marking versus unmarking concept and really thinking through that. And, and I think too, the important part of like, you know, making sure it's honest and meaningful, doing, thinking really about your own positionality in this space. Like what are the blinders that I have, right? I don't really know a ton about indigenous studies. So 
what blinders am I having around those ideas? And so that's what I would say is like, you, there's always, a, I, I mean, this is my personal opinion, of course, but I think that there's always a, a place that where you can, no matter what, always look at power, privilege, and oppression, no matter what group or time or era or lens you're taking, um, it's just, you know, are, are you thinking about those ideas? And then that goes back to like, you know, how do you do that? It's just reading, I would say, engaging with the kind of literature that that changes your mind, that like changes how you think, which is like, for me, it was feminist queer crit, right? Like I read that and I now just totally think differently about time and the body and space. <laughs> so that's what I would, that would be my um, advice. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm kind of going through this myself. So I'm a, a doctoral student and I'm writing my dissertation on the development of costume conservation. And you know, when I when I proposed it, I was like, oh, I'm just gonna trace textile conservation and dress studies and this nexus at con costume conservation. And what I'm now starting to really think about is, is who, who created the practice and why, what were their ways in? what was the use of unpaid labor is actually a, a major focus um you know the issue of volunteers why you know how does gender play into it how does class play into it um and so i'm, I'm trying to complicate this timeline that i was creating and am i centering it i i still don't know if i am um maybe it is something that's on the periphery um i am still struggling myself with this um yeah but i'm, I'm thinking about it <laughs> trying i think that that's you know there's always um the, the theories behind um doing this kind of scholarship are are exactly the um, power, privilege, and oppression that Kelly keeps talking about. That those are things that are always present, no matter who is the topic of your study. So if you are looking at the dress practices of Wall Street bankers in the 1950s, who are, you know, they're wealthy white men who have a lot of power and privilege, the way that you frame your purpose and your questions can reveal how perhaps they are using dress to reinforce their power. And then you begin to hear and to see the voices and experiences of people who are not the primary topic of your research, because they're the ones who are being impacted by the reinforcement of power and privilege. They're the ones who are being oppressed in the story. And while you don't necessarily need to center their voices if they are not the primary topic of your research, they become present in a way that's not just a token. It becomes, you know, they're there in the story about these people who you are talking about. Um, and so it's, it is, I think, definitely, as Kelly and Sarah are talking about, what questions are you asking? And how, how are you then gonna look at the sources? How might you go back and look at your sources again, or your interpretation of them that you have come up with to um, bring in that, acknowledgement of power dynamics of the the, um, the reality that there is no neutrality um, which is really at the heart of what this work means is that nothing and no one is neutral um, and that I think that's the that's like you start there and that's your primary assumption about oh, no matter what you're studying you're going to start to notice things that you didn't maybe notice before and be able to bring in voices and experiences that weren't there before. Um, I should also say too, like, there are probably white men on Wall Street, like, they're also, this is the other part of this, they have a lot of power, but the system of power is also limiting them in ways that they probably don't see. And to study that is very challenging um, without just sort of falling into the the trap of reinforcing their power instead of being, um, you know, critical of, of how they are maybe grabbing more power and um, at the expense of other people's um, lives and using it in order to kind of reinforce the situation that they don't see as, as harmful and limiting to themselves. Well, do we want to 
um, end with um, one suggestion that people might like, you know, if you had one piece of advice for folks who might want to move forward, um, what would that be in our last kind of two minutes? And I'll, uh, Katie or, or Sarah, I'll go ahead and let you all go first. I guess I'll start. Yeah. Um, well, the status quo is not neutral. <laughs> I'll just say that. Um, you know, speaking from exhibitions, exhibitions are one of the most charged, you know, activities you can take and preservation and curation, all of that. Um, every choice you make, there's a reason why you're making that choice. And um, it, it's once you start thinking of it, you're, you kind of get blown away with what all it means. I think I would say to just put it, do the work and put it out there and don't be afraid. Like that is something like, I still struggle with it sometimes. Like what is the reaction gonna be? I think we all were a little nervous about doing this, this panel this evening because sometimes somebody shows up and they just, they wanna be argumentative. They don't wanna be accepting. Um, and it's coming from a place of defensiveness on their part that can make you then be defensive. Sometimes it's also coming from people who just, they don't know and they are genuinely, ask, genuinely asking a question of you, trying to understand something. Um, and it's always something too, where it's like, it's never gonna be, it's never gonna be perfect. And so many of us, I think that do scholarship and are working in, especially in like universities, producing publications, doing a lot of that kind of work, like, we're very driven people were like perfectionists and so it's you know there's importance and beauty and the imperfectness of this work which it will always be because it, we are reflecting the imperfect nature of our world and how we are understanding it and trying to do better at it to be more equitable about whose voices and experiences we are listening to and uplifting and are reading about and um, who are participating in creating that scholarship. But it, you know, be, I would say be careful with your work, but, and you, you know, you care when you're doing the work. You wanna make careful decisions about what you're putting out there, but you don't want to be operating from a place of fear. And I think that's a question I've started to ask myself. Why am I making a decision here to change something? Is it because I'm afraid? don't come from that space because that's when you will continue to cause further harm when you when you won't put out the work that truly does center marginalized and minoritized people uh, and i would just say the first thing is to just begin where you are and just acknowledge wherever you're starting like i didn't take my first i didn't understand the dynamics between power, privilege, and oppression. I mean, maybe until my sophomore year of college, I I never talked about race growing up. I I didn't think about justice. That's just not that wasn't my upbringing, and I just kept learning. And the other piece is to always be open to critical self reflection, and and being. It be uh, putting yourself out there and just knowing that it it could be wrong and that but you're you know just working towards being self reflective and you know you might do something and then it might be you know wrong later in the eyes of someone else and um and of course there's tension in that because it can be really harmful right so it's like just having that dialogue and um, just surround yourself by critical people who can be critical of you and be open to that. That has been my best um, experience really is just beginning where I am and then just knowing that I might make mistakes and that try trying to surround myself with critical people to criticize my work. Yeah, fantastic. Those are all just like phenomenal insights. Thank you all so much, truly. Like this has been so great to listen to you all talk about this and and to everyone who's joined us i really appreciate you all taking the time to to be here live with us um of course this is going to be this is recorded and so it will be on the youtube channel for csa as well as other panels that have been talking about some similar topics as well so feel free to kind of dive into that um 
so I just kind of wanted to, to close by saying one, you know, again, thank you all, but also if you're interested in the power privilege specifically about CSA and like justice relating to CSA, um, there is the DEAI committee, like please feel free to, to join that if you're interested in those topics. And also if you're doing this research, I just want to reiterate, please submit an abstract if you're able to, um, to the national conference. And the, those abstracts are due by um, October 15th. So hopefully this has given you kind of some inspiration, um, kind of new lenses, old, well, old lenses, but maybe new perspectives. Um, yeah, I just, I really think the whole notion of just like, start where you are, you know, it, it doesn't have to be perfect and nothing is neutral. I think that's so important. We all said that nothing is neutral, constantly questioned. So thank you all so much. And I hope everyone has a fantastic night or day or morning, wherever you're coming from. So see y'all later. Bye. Thanks, everyone.